Hey guys, we're gonna solve this rational inequality. I'm gonna give you some pretty specific steps to follow. And you might be like, okay, I can do that, but I don't really get why that gave us the answer. But then at the end, stick around, because I'm gonna show you why it worked. And it makes me very happy. <laughs> so I hope you'll stick around for that part. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is I want everything on one side of my inequality. So we're good here. I want everything on one side and zero on the other. Guess what, we're golden. The next thing I wanna do is factor if I need to. So my denominator here can be factored. This is actually a difference of two squares. If you need a review on that, I will link one in the corner, but this is going to stay X minus one on top. And on bottom, we are gonna have X plus two times X minus two. And this is still greater than zero. The next thing I'm going to do is to set each of these equal to zero. So I'm going to set X minus one equal to zero, X plus two equal to zero, and X minus two equal to zero. So for this one to solve for X, I'd add two, sorry, <clears throat> I'd add one to both sides, get X equals one, subtract two from both sides, get X equals negative two, and add two to both sides to get X equals two. All right, next I want to represent, I just said that kind of weird. I want to represent each of these on a number line. So here is my number line. We all love number lines. They're a party. And I want to represent each of these numbers. So I would have one approximately here, two, and negative two would be about here. It doesn't have to be perfectly spaced. This is just a visual representation for us. So I want a circle on each of these, but I need to know if it's an open circle or a closed circle. Well, first of all, I know that negative two and two are going to be open circles. Why do I know that? Because if I were to plug in two or negative two for X, it would make my denominator zero, which is not allowed. We don't do that in math, no zeros in denominators. So th that's why those two are open circles. Then to figure out if one is an open or closed circle, I look at my sign. Because it's greater than, it's going to be an open circle as well. What would make it a closed circle would be if this were greater than or equal to, like that, then it would be a closed circle. But in this case, it's just greater than. So we have an open circle. Okay, from here, we are going to do something that we affectionately call sign analysis. It sounds fancy, but it's really not that fancy. What we're going to do is for each of these regions, left of two, between, sorry, negative two, <clears throat> between negative two and one, between one and two, and to the right of two, we want to figure out when I plug in a, num a number for x in those sections, will my output be positive or negative? All right, and if that sounded like a mouthful, let's go ahead and try it and see what happens. So I'm picking a number to the left of negative two. So let's just pick negative 10. I'm going to plug in negative 10 for x, and I don't really care what my numerical answer is. All I care about is if it's positive or negative. So watch how we do this. I'm gonna plug in negative 10 for X and I would on top get negative 10 minus one, which would give me a negative on top. If I plug in negative 10 here, I get negative 10 plus two, which would also be negative. Negative 10 minus two, which would also be negative. So I've got negative on top and a negative times a negative on bottom, which gives me a positive. Then I have a negative divided by a positive, which would be negative. So that tells me that this region to the left of negative two is negative. Now this might be the point where you're like, I don't get why she's doing this. Stick around to the end. All right, between negative two and one now, I need to pick a number between there. Zero's in there, so let's pick zero. You could pick a different number if you wanted to. So if I plug in zero, I get zero minus one, which would be negative on top. Zero plus two would be positive and zero minus two would be negative. So then on top I have a negative. On bottom I have a positive times a negative, which is negative. 
and a negative divided by a negative is positive. All right, so this section is positive. Now I'm gonna pick a number between one and two. So let's pick 1.5. I was gonna jokingly be like, let's pick 1.29764, but then I didn't, and then, okay. All right, so if I plug in 1.5, I get 1.5 minus one, which would give me a positive number on top. 1.5 plus two would give me a positive on bottom and 1.5 minus two would give me a negative. So on top, I have a positive. On bottom, positive times negative is negative, and positive divided by a negative is negative. So this section here is negative. All right, one more. Don't forget about over here to the right of two. So I need a number bigger than two. Let's just pick 10. So when I plug in 10, I get 10 minus one, which would be positive. 10 plus two, which would be positive. 10 minus two would be positive. And so on top I have a positive, bottom I have a positive, so that's positive. Okay, next we're going to look back at our inequality. All right, from here, we want to know where this is greater than zero. Well, what is greater than zero? positive numbers, right? So I want to know where this is positive, which I already figured out. It's positive between negative two and one and to the right of two. That is where this is positive. If I pick any number between negative two and one or any number bigger than two and I plug it in for X, I will get a number that makes this statement true. I'll get a number over here that is greater than zero. So this is my answer, but your teacher probably doesn't want you to turn in a number line as an answer. I don't know, maybe they're okay with it, but they probably want it represented as an inequality or in interval notation. So to represent this as an inequality, I would say X is greater than negative two and x is less than one. That represents this right here. It's greater than negative two and less than one. We could also write that like this if we wanted to, okay? So that represents this section, but what about this section? So x, negative two is less than x is less than one, or x can also be greater than two. So that is my answer right there. Notice that these are not equal to because of the open circles. If any of those were closed circles, we would do the equal to sign under it. All right, that is my answer in inequality form. If your teacher wants it in interval notation, I would say pick a number from negative two to one. And I use parentheses because those numbers aren't included. Again, if these were closed circles, I would use a bracket. All right, then I do a U for union and say you can also pick a number from two all the way to what? Seven? No, all the way to infinity. And both of those get parentheses as well. Infinity always gets a parenthesis. So that is the same answer as that, just written in a different form. All right, now's the exciting part. Are you excited? <laughs> I'm going to show you why we did this, why this random setting things equal to zero, this sign analysis weirdness we did. Why did all of that work? Okay, we're going to pretend for a second that I was being asked to graph this. Don't run and hide because I said graph. Pretend I was being asked to graph y equals x minus one over x squared minus four. Now I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about how to graph this because I actually have a video I will link in the corner where I graph this exact problem. But I will just kind of go over it real briefly. If I were graphing this first, I would set the denominator equal to zero to figure out where my vertical asymptotes are. And I would figure out that they are at two and negative two.
So there are my vertical asymptotes at two and negative two. I'm just gonna write two and negative two up here. Then by looking at the degrees, I would figure out that my horizontal asymptote is at zero. I'm not gonna draw a line all the way across there because it's kind of hard to see on the x-axis, but there you go. And then I would figure out my x-intercept, which I would figure out is at one right there. And then applying what I know about asymptotes and functions, I would figure out that this graph looks something like this. There we go. And like this. Okay. So this is the graph of this guy. But why do I care about that? Because remember what my original question was. I was being asked, where is this greater than zero? Well, watch this, guys. Greater than zero would be above the x-axis, right? So where am I greater than zero? I'm greater than zero from this asymptote to the x-intercept, which would be from negative two to one. And look, from negative two to one. Where else am I greater than zero? I'm also greater than zero. From this asymptote, I don't actually touch the asymptote, which is why it's not equal to, but from two to infinity, because that's going to keep going that way. Guys, how cool is that? Tell me it's cool. It's so cool, right? <laughs> when I figured that out, I thought it was the coolest thing ever, but I am a weird internet math lady. So if you don't think it's that cool, that's okay, but I think it's so cool. So that is why we set things equal to zero. When we set those equal to zero, what we were really doing was finding our x-intercept. That's what that one was. And when we set those equal to zero, we were finding our vertical asymptotes. Oh my gosh, is that so cool? And then this sign analysis business was just figuring out from negative infinity to negative two, negative. See how it's negative? Oh my gosh. From negative two to one, positive. Look, and so on. So that's why we set things equal to zero. That's why we did the sign analysis. That's why it worked. And I hope that made sense. All right. I will link a whole playlist for you if you need some more examples. Thanks.